one of the things that I like about it is I feel like maybe maybe this is just implicit, um, but I feel like it's actually a great model for production and kind of like a heuristic uh, for creating multimedia. I think people a lot of times think of assessment as like what comes after. So you do all the work and then you kind of look back in the rearview mirror and you apply this assessment thing. But those those paradigms about, you know, the difference between repetition versus contrast or juxtaposition, all of those things, uh, I don't know if you had in mind that this is actually kind of a, a, a composing recipe as much as an hmm. assessment recipe. I hadn't thought of that, but no, I mean, I think that makes sense. And, uh, you know, you're right. Assessment shouldn't be the last thing you think of. In some ways, it's what I, I tried to point out on my website, so it's really got to be... Uh, you, you have to have a coherent um, approach where your goals for the course, what you want students to know or to learn, is it, are tied to the projects and tied to your assessment of them. And so I think, um, um, and and also, it's really important, and it was important back then too, to be able, to have students be able to articulate or at least in the classroom to be able to help to, to be able to draw their attention to what they were doing, you know, as they were doing it. Because again, it was, you know, these were new things and they weren't being asked to do this elsewhere, but to, to help them articulate the processes, the continuities with other kinds of composing and creative processes that they, that they undertake in other, in other courses and other aspects of their lives. So, um, so I hadn't really thought of it as a kind of a composing as oriented toward composing but I can kind of see that and also it's interesting that after that web text I started you know doing the inventio section of Kairos which is really all about composing scholarship at least you know kind of what what goes on behind the scenes when people do multimodal scholarship so I think for me the process of creating that web text was was so um, informative and it drew my attention to so many of the different kinds of challenges that are involved when you're making uh, a multimodal piece of scholarship and especially the, the for me the process of working with the Kairos editors and getting their feedback and seeing how much my final product changed from you know what I had ri- originally submitted that then I was you know I was fully on board with the Inventio mission which is you know to help other people understand what multimodal scholarship is all about and what's involved in it and what kind of uh, you know similar and and different kinds of challenges involved in creating that kind of scholarship. So. One other thing that I thought I'd check in with you about in terms of the text is at that moment, one of the challenges with assessment, I think that you're articulating is that we're just kind of stuck in print paradigms or there's this sort of like pull of print behaviors that are really familiar and that it would be a real problem to cast assessment using those same molds in Mm -hmm. some ways. And I'm wondering, you know, what you think about, you know, the amount of time that has elapsed since then and now, and if, you know, has that shifted, or is it still something we need to watch out for? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, maybe it's it kind of is answered differently by every teacher, I mean, by every instructor, because I think when this is new to you and, you know, and when it's new to the students, like if you're a graduate student teaching freshman composition and you've got to integrate some kind of multimodal aspect uh, or assignment into your course, then of course you're going to rely on what you're most familiar with, which is, you know, how to to assess that and even how to teach it really, um, which would be, you know, teaching print-based work. And then, but then I think if you've been doing it for a while and and you're working with upper division students or students who are familiar with this kind of composing, then it's, um, you know, then you can kind of um, move on to other things. I remember when I when I first started teaching uh, new media, I would always have students do do a project and then submit a written report alongside the project. That that was really the only, you know, that was for me the most comfortable thing to do, and for the students too, in some ways, because they could use the the paper to explain what they were doing in the project and it wasn't always self-explanatory you know and now I don't do that at all anymore and what I do instead is I ask students to create something that's more kind of um, um, naturally integrated with the project that they're doing so for instance if they do I have them do an infographic and then they post it on a blog site and write an introduction to it you know so it's more for a general audience than than writing to me Um, and I have them do you know other things where 
the written goes more smoothly alongside the multimodal. I think now, you know, 10 years later, 10 years after having, um, you know, written the web text, there's so many more places online where that happens. You know, there's so many more, uh, you know, even just taking blogs, for example, and the in integration of video and image and so on with text. So it's just more, kind of more natural for these things to come together smoothly. And, um, and so I think in that sense, there isn't that kind of uh, opposition anymore between print and multimedia. They kind of work together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, a lot of the more recent web texts in Kairos, or not even more recent, a lot of, you know, all along the way, like I'm thinking of your web text too, where you have the video on, you know, one side, the prosumer text, you know, with your video here and then the text going on here. There's lots of, you know, just different models for making that integration more natural and more, um, you know, uh, more of kind of a unity unity so it sounds like you build self-assessment into a lot of your pedagogy too so it's not yeah. just you coming as the assessor but it's part of what the students do with their own work is that fair to say and yeah. then if so I'm wondering if you find that there's some like bleed over or extension into other kinds of work that they do with multimedia like in their personal lives, you know, if they start to think about repetition versus juxtaposition and become self-aware in yeah. that, you know, when they're making a Facebook post, do they do that or, or, I don't know, have you paid attention to anything like that? No, I mean, that would be a great study to do, wouldn't it? You know, to find out what, to what extent, because, you know, we're all interested in transfer across from one classroom to the next, but transfer from a classroom to, you know, their actual lives when they're using social media and, and so on. You know, I think to some extent you bring in the like you you could bring in LinkedIn or something like that into the classroom and have and and so draw kind of explicit draw students' attention explicitly to what they're doing. Um, you know, via a project or just talking about that. But um, yeah, I don't I don't I don't know if it's really. There would be an interesting study to see if it's changed how they how they work outside the classroom in these kind of different multimedia, multimodal opportunities that they have. I was talking to my students the other day and, you know, we talked about genre and I mentioned to them, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, students will say, oh, I'm a terrible writer. And, you know, you're maybe you're a terrible writer of a certain thing, but a really great writer of something else. And uh, like a Facebook post or a tweet or whatever. And so I think drawing their attention just to the fact that they use so many different genres just on a kind of a daily basis um, and that they need to develop expertise, or, or they don't. I mean, maybe it's kind of up to them whether they need to develop expertise in those areas or not. Um, but making them aware of the fact that what we're doing in class is a, is a particular genre and that there are expectations and conventions and so on of that genre, I think that may just, that in itself may help them when they, you know, move over to another uh, genre, another activity of writing and hopefully think about what the expectations and conventions are of that genre. It's just interesting because there's so many more, I'm sure you found this too in your teaching, there's so many um, new venues for different kinds of combinations of, of media. And uh, so I think that's fascinating from a teacher's perspective and from students as well. Yeah. But you're right, the question is really an important one. How does, how does, are we teaching them in a way that helps them transfer skills and experience and knowledge from from one to another? Yeah. And like the collage assignments, I mean, I I would imagine something like the idea of of you know, don't be redundant with your visual and your textual piece in a collage. That probably would transfer pretty easily to a video. Or yeah. you know, when you insert audio, so I think those you know across those genres probably mm -hmm. works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Do you still do the collage like those assignments that are in the text? Do you still give those assignments? And if I so, do. what, what I, do you notice now that you didn't notice then? I give a variation on the assignment. So that assignment, I I had uh, different kinds of qu quotes that I would students could choose from, and they were all meant to be kind of abstract. You know, I didn't want I didn't want there to be an easy literal translation. 
that the students could then, you know, represent uh, visually. Um, and so I've done that, uh, but just this uh, quarter, actually, I, I'm doing a kind of variation on that collage project where the students are all doing um, a kind of text image combination uh, about Isla Vista, which is the student community right next door here to UCSB, and kind of a um, community with a troubled reputation. Uh, you know, if you go online and type in Isla Vista, you see, you know, the, it's a party town, there's been shootings and, you know, various kinds of tragedies there and so on. And so I wanted to give the students an opportunity to represent um, what they think of Isla Vista. And basically I phrased it as, um, I, I asked them, you know, what do you, what do you want to say about Isla Vista, about the town where you live, and, and how can you use text and image, combinations of text and image to convey that? message. And I, 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 I'm not sure I would do this again, but I associated it with the genre of a postcard. So I asked them to create the front of a postcard and then the back of the postcard. And the front of the postcard was a, um, a collage um, and with text as well, exploring a different, you know, a, kind of a narrow aspect of life in Isla Vista and what, they're, what they were feeling about that. So students wrote about um, trash. They wrote about... Um, yeah, they were, they, I shouldn't say wrote, I mean, they created projects about these different things. And then, um, and they're just in the process of kind of finishing and finishing them up. And, and then on the back of the postcard, they're meant to write it, you know, kind of as a message to someone, um, uh, elaborating on and kind of complementing, using the text on the back to elaborate on and complement the text image combination on the front. So it's a similar kind of assignment, and but it's really, I'm, I'm trying to find ways to help students see this not so much as just a class project, but, you know, as, as an actual piece of communication that they could, um, you know, that they that they would want to send out into the world. And then I think that really draws their attention more to the idea of how, communicating in multiple modes the challenges of it, but also the opportunities and how you can really reach an audience um, maybe more more easily or more effectively when you think about combining text and image. Yeah. So yeah, I am doing a variation on that assignment and I think I probably will keep doing it. It has several advantages. I mean, it's a, it helps students learn Photoshop, which comes in handy, you know, for other assignments. And then also really gets them, you know, the, the whole teaching multi-modality, multi-modal projects, there's so many, you know, the, the kind of multi of that can be really complex. And so if you say, okay, we're taking text and image, we're looking at kind of the visual qualities of text and the textual or, or you know, verbal qualities of image and, and kind of thinking about how to make that combination effectively, then I think that's kind of an easy way into multimodal composing. And then you can introduce, you know, audio and video and other kinds of things down the road.